Hello everyone. Once again, this is our science teacher Tim Martin, and this is Meteorology Part 14, where we will start discussing weather fronts. The last video we discussed air masses. Several years ago, when I was flying across the country looking out the window, I was able to make this image. You'll notice there are two distinct air masses in this image. On the left is an air mass that contains more moisture than what we see on the right-hand side of the screen. This is obvious due to the amount of clouds in each half of the image. What does this look like on the ground? Well, just last year I was able to get this panorama, nearly 180 degrees, on our school's campus. It had been cloudy for several days, and then it cleared. There was a very distinct line between the clear air mass and the cloudy air mass. This line that separates two air masses is what we know of as a front. So let's discuss this a little further. Very simply, a front is the boundary between two or more air masses. Fronts are phenomena that only occur in middle latitudes. There are no fronts in tropical regions or in Arctic regions. Just think about that. If a front separates two different bodies of air with similar temperature and moisture, well, the temperature in the tropics is always warm, and the temperature in the Arctic regions is always cold, so there will be no separation between the warmer and cooler air in those locations. How fronts work has to do with density, with warm air rising and cool air sinking closer to the surface. There are four different types of fronts, and let's take a look at each. There's the stationary front. On weather maps, it's modeled with a triangle and bubble, triangle and bubble. A cold front is modeled with a line with triangles. You might want to think of these as icicles. The warm front is modeled with a line with bubbles on it, or maybe you could think of this like boiling water. Finally, the fourth front is the occluded front. You'll notice that the triangle and bubbles are pointing in the same direction on the occluded front. The colors are also significant here. If we see a stationary front and the weather map is a color map, it will alternate red, blue, red, blue. Cold fronts will be indicated in blue, warm fronts indicated in red, occluded fronts in either pink or purple. So let's look at stationary fronts more specifically. Here's a weather map that shows a nice long stationary front stretching across much of the United States. So what's going on with the stationary front? Well, as you might guess by the name, it is in fact stationary. Warm air is on one side of the front, cool air on the other. Neither one has more pressure, so the boundary stays stationary. This is sometimes what's known as the polar front. It extends around the world between 40 and 60 degrees latitude. Now, if this sounds familiar, it should. You've been drawing this on the global wind diagram. This is the location where the polar easterlies push against the westerlies. Where these two different air masses meet, that in fact is a front. As long as the pressure is similar on both sides, it remains stationary. Fronts don't always stay stationary. If a front is coming from the north in the northern hemisphere, it's likely to be a cold front. Here we see two weather maps indicating long cold fronts extending across the United States. So how are the dynamics with the cold front? Cold air creeps along, being heavier or more dense, it sticks closer to the ground, forcing the warm air up, and you'll notice that often can lead to cloud formation. Cold fronts happen when a cool air mass or cold air mass overtakes a warm air mass. Again, because of density, the cold air mass will be on the bottom. The cold air pushes the warm air higher into the sky, and if it's moving fast enough, convective clouds or thunderstorms may occur just ahead of the fast-moving cold front. If we have this line of thunderstorms, it will be referred to as a squall line. The warm, moist air rises rapidly, creating very strong thunderstorms. Here are a couple radar images that show squall lines. Sometimes the squall lines associated with a cold front can extend from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Canada. On the left, we see a much shorter squall line extending across several states. Here's a very dramatic squall line 
There was cooler, dry air coming in from the northwest, warm, moist air out of the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see a very distinct line in the clouds. These storms over Gerald, Texas, produced very violent thunderstorms, even tornadoes that produced several fatalities. A warm front, on the other hand, will frequently be much shorter. Here are several warm fronts indicated on these weather maps. So what goes on with a warm front? Well, warm air is now overtaking cooler air. Because warm air is less dense, it climbs above the cool air, producing a layer of clouds. So the warm front occurs when a warm air mass overtakes the cooler air mass. This will produce layered clouds. We may start out the day seeing some cirrus clouds followed by cirrus stratus, then maybe some alto stratus, and gradually throughout the day the cloud deck lowers and stratus clouds appear. Maybe even later on we'll see nimbostratus clouds. But all the stratus or layered clouds are associated with an approaching warm front. Finally, we have the occluded front. Here in pink, we can see several occluded fronts on different weather maps. What goes on with the occluded front? You'll see the diagram is a bit more confusing at this point. On the right hand side, you see something that looks a lot like a warm front. And on the left hand side, we see the beginning of a cold front. That is indeed our setup for the occluded front. As we put this into motion, we can see the cold air mass overtaking the other cold air mass. The occluded front happens when a fast moving cold front overtakes the slower moving warm front. Notice I'm using the term front here rather than just using the word air mass. Each front is a boundary between two air masses, so in this case, we're looking at the interactions of three air masses. What happens with the warm air? It's completely lifted off the ground as the cold air mass overtakes the cool air mass. Again, this can be associated with a lot of cloud formation. The interactions of all four of these fronts are very useful when we go to start thinking about the weather in mid-latitudes. In our next video, we'll take a look at the development of mid-latitude cyclones. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.